The Boar's Head Tavern, East Cheap. A Shakespearean Research. Quote, A tavern is the rendezvous, the exchange, the staple of good fellows. I have heard my great-grandfather tell how his great-great-grandfather should say that it was an old proverb when his great-grandfather was a child, that it was a good wind that blew a man to the wine. End quote. Mother Bombay. It is a pious custom in some Catholic countries to honor the memory of saints by votive lights burnt before their pictures. The popularity of a saint, therefore, may be known by the number of these offerings. One, perhaps, is left to molder in the darkness of his little chapel. Another may have a solitary lamp to throw its blinking rays athwart his effigy, while the whole blaze of adoration is lavished at the shrine of some beatified father of renown. The wealthy devotee brings his huge luminary of wax, the eager zealot his seven-branched candlestick, and even the medicant pilgrim is by no means satisfied that sufficient light is thrown upon the deceased unless he hangs up his little lamp of smoking oil. The consequence is that in the eagerness to enlighten they are often apt to obscure, and I have occasionally seen an unlucky saint almost smoked out of countenance by the officiousness of his followers. In like manner, it is fared with the immortal Shakespeare. Every writer considers it his bounden duty to light up some portion of his character or works, and to rescue some merit from oblivion. The commentator, opulent in words, produces vast tomes of dissertations. The common herd of editors send up mists of obscurity from their notes at the bottom of each page. And every casual scribbler brings his farthing brushlight of eulogy or research to swell the cloud of incense and of smoke. As I honor all established usages of my brethren of the quill, I thought it but proper to contribute my might of homage to the memory of the illustrious bard. I was for some time, however, sorely puzzled in what way I should discharge this duty. I found myself anticipated in every attempt at a new reading. Every doubtful line has been examined a dozen different ways, and perplexed beyond the reach of elucidation. And as to fine passages, they had all been amply praised by previous admirers. Nay, so completely had the bard of late been overlarded with panegaic by a great German critic, it was difficult now to find even a fault that had not been argued into a beauty. In this perplexity, I was one morning turning over his pages, when I casually opened upon a comic scene of Henry the Fourth, and was, in a moment, completely lost in the madcap revelry of the Boar's Head Tavern. So vividly and naturally are these scenes of humor depicted, and with such force and consistency are the characters sustained, that they become mingled up in the mind with the facts and personages of real life. To few readers does it occur that these are all ideal creations of a poet's brain, and that, in sober truth, no such knot of merry royasters ever enlivened the dull neighborhoods of East Cheap. For my part, I love to give myself up to the illusions of poetry. A hero of fiction that never existed is just as valuable to me as a hero of history that existed a thousand years since, and, if I may be excused such an insensibility to the common ties of human nature, I would not give up fat Jack for half the great men of ancient chronicle. What have the heroes of yore done for me or men like me? They have conquered countries of which I do not enjoy an acre, or they have gained laurels of which I do not inherit a leaf, or they have furnished examples of hare-brained prowess, which I have neither the opportunity nor the inclination to follow. But old Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, sweet Jack Falstaff, has enlarged the boundaries of human enjoyment. He has added vast regions of wit and good humor, in which the poorest man may revel, and has bequeathed a never-failing inheritance of jolly laughter to make mankind merrier and better to the latest posterity. A thought suddenly struck me. I will make a pilgrimage to East Cheap, said I, closing the book, and see if the old Boar's Head Tavern still exists. Who knows, but I might light upon some legendary traces of Dame Quickly and her guests. At any rate, there will be a kindred pleasure in treading the halls, once vocal with their mirth, to that the topper enjoys in smelling to the empty cask, once filled with generous wine. The resolution was no sooner formed than put in execution. I forbear to treat of the various adventures and wonders I encountered in my travels, of the haunted regions of Cock Lane, of the faded glories of Little Britain and the parts adjacent, what perils I ran in Catenian Street and Old Jewry, of the renowned Guildhall and its two stunted giants, the pride and wonder of the city, and the terror of all unlucky urchins, and how I visited London Stone, and struck my staff upon it in imitation of that arch-rebel Jack Cade. Let it suffice to say that I at length arrived in Merry Eastcheap. 
that ancient region of wit and wassail, where the very names of the streets relished a good cheer, as Pudding Lane bears testimony even at the present day. For East Cheap, says Old Stowe, was always famous for its convivial doings. The cooks cried hot ribs of beef roasted, pies well baked, and other victuals. There was clattering of pewter pots, harp, pipe, and psaltery. Alas, how sadly is the scene changed since the roaring days of Falstaff and Old Stowe. The madcap roisterer has given place to the plodding tradesman, the clattering of pots, and the sound of harps and psaltery, to the din of carts, and the accursed dinging of the dustman's bell. And no song is heard, save, happily, the strain of some siren from Billingsgate, chanting the eulogy of deceased mackerel. I sought, in vain, for the ancient abode of Dame Quickly. The only relic of it is a boar's head, carved in relief in stone, which formerly served as a sign, but at present is built into the parting line of two houses which stand on the site of the renowned old tavern. For the history of this little abode of good fellowship, I was referred to a tallow chandler's widow opposite, who had been born and brought up on the spot, and was looked up to as the indisputable chronicler of the neighborhood. I found her seated in a little back parlor, the window of which looked out upon a yard about eight feet square laid out in a flower garden, while the glass door opposite afforded a distant view of the street, through a vista of soap and tallow candles. The two views which comprised, in all probability, her prospects in life, and the little world in which she had lived and moved, and had her being for the better part of a century. To be versed in the history of Eastcheap, great and little, from London stone even unto the monument, was doubtless, in her opinion, to be acquainted with the history of the universe. Yet with all this, she possessed the simplicity of true wisdom, and that liberal communicative disposition which I have generally remarked in intelligent old ladies knowing in the concerns of their neighborhood. Her information, however, did not extend far back into antiquity. She could throw no light upon the history of the boar's head from the time that Dame quickly espoused the valiant pistol until the great fire of London when it was unfortunately burnt down. It was soon rebuilt and continued to flourish under the old name and sign until a dying landlord, struck with remorse for double scores, bad measures, and other iniquities which are incident to the sinful race of publicans, endeavored to make his peace with heaven by bequeathing the tavern to St. Michael's Church, Crooked Lane, toward the supporting of a chaplain. For some time the vestry meetings were regularly held there, but it was observed that the old boar never held up his head under church government. He gradually declined, and finally gave his last gasp about thirty years since. The tavern was then turned into shops, but she informed me that a picture of it was still preserved in St. Michael's Church, which stood just in the rear. To get a sight of this picture was now my determination, so, having informed myself of the abode of the sexton, I took my leave of the venerable chronicler of Eastcheap, my visit having doubtless raised greatly her opinion of her legendary lore, and furnished an important incident in the history of her life. It cost me some difficulty, and much curious inquiry, to ferret out the humble hanger-on to the church. I had to explore Crooked Lane, and diverse little alleys and elbows and dark passages with which this old city is perforated like an ancient cheese, or a worm-eaten chest of drawers. At length, I traced him to a corner of a small court surrounded by lofty houses, where the inhabitants enjoy about as much of the face of heaven as a community of frogs at the bottom of a well. The sextant was a meek, acquiescing little man, of a bowing, lowly habit. Yet he had a pleasant twinkling in his eye, and if encouraged, would now and then hazard a small pleasantry, such as a man of his low estate might venture to make in the company of high church wardens and other mighty men of the earth. I found him in company with a deputy organist, seated apart, like Milton's angels, discoursing, no doubt, on high doctrinal points, and settling the affairs of the church or a friendly pot of ale, for the lower classes of English seldom deliberate on any weighty matter without the assistance of a cool tankard to clear their understandings. I arrived at the moment when they had finished their ale and their argument, and were about to repair to the church to put it in order. So, having made known my wishes, I received their gracious permission to accompany them. The church of St. Michael's, Crooked Lane, standing a short distance from Billingsgate, is enriched with the tombs of many fishmongers of renown, and as every profession has its galaxy of glory and its constellation of great men, I presume the monument of a mighty fishmonger of the olden time is regarded with as much reverence by succeeding generations of the craft as poets feel on contemplating the tomb of Virgil or soldiers the monument of a Marlborough or Ternay. I cannot but turn aside, while thus speaking of illustrious men, to observe that St. Michael's, Crooked Lane, contains also the ashes of that doughty champion, William Walsworth, Knight, who so manfully clove down the sturdy white, Watt Tyler, in Smithfield, a hero worthy of honorable blazon, 
as almost the only Lord Mayor on record famous for deeds of arms, the sovereigns of Cockney being generally renowned as the most pacific of all potentates. Footnote. The following was the ancient inscription on the monument of this worthy, which, unhappily, was destroyed in the great conflagration. Here under lieth a man of fame, William Walworth, called by name. Fishmonger he was in lifetime here, and twice Lord Mayor, as in books appear, who with courage, doubt, and manly might, slew Jack Straw in King Richard's sight, for which act done, and true intent, the king made him knight incontinent, and gave him arms, as here you see, to declare his fact and chivalry. He left this life the year of our God, thirteen hundred for score and three odd. An error in the foregoing transcription has been corrected by the venerable Stowe, whereas, saith he, it hath been far spread abroad by vulgar opinion that the rebel smitten down so manfully by Sir William Walworth, the then worthy Lord Mayor, was named Jack Straw, and not Watt Taylor. I thought good to reconcile this rash-conceived doubt by such testimony as I find in ancient and good records. The principal leaders, or captains, of the commons were Watt Tyler, as the first man. The second was John, or Jack Straw, etc., etc. Stowe's London. End footnote. Adjoining the church, in a small cemetery, immediately under the back window of what was once the boar's head, stands the tombstone of Robert Preston, woolen drawer at the tavern. It is now nearly a century since this trusty drawer of good liquor closed his bustling career and was thus quietly deposited within the call of his customers. As I was clearing away the weeds from his epitaph, the little sexton drew me on one side with a mysterious air, and informed me in a low voice that once upon a time, on a dark wintry night, when the wind was unruly, howling and whistling, banging about doors and windows, and twirling weathercocks so that the living were frightened out of their beds, and even the dead could not sleep quietly in their graves, the ghost of honest Preston, which happened to be airing itself in the churchyard, was attracted by the well-known call of Waiter from the boar's head, and made its sudden appearance in the midst of the roaring club, just as the parish clerk was singing a stave from the Mirror Garland of King Death to the discomfiture of sundry train-band captains and the conversion of an infidel attorney, who became a zealous Christian on the spot and was never known to twist the truth afterwards, except in the way of business. I beg it may be remembered that I do not pledge myself for the authenticity of this antidote, although it is well known that the churchyards and by-corners of this old metropolis very much infested with perturbed spirits, and every one must have heard of the Cock Lane ghost, and the apparition that guards the regalia in the tower, which has frightened so many bold sentinels almost out of their wits. Be all this as it may, this Robert Preston seems to have been a worthy successor to the nimble-tongued Francis, who attended upon the rebels of Prince Hal, to have been equally prompt with his anon anon sir and to have transcended his predecessor in honesty for falstaff the veracity of whose taste no man will venture to impeach flatly accuses francis of putting lime in his sack whereas honest preston's epithet lands him for the sobriety of his conduct the soundness of his wine and the fairness of his measure footnote as this transcription is rife with excellent morality i transcribe it for the admonition of delinquent tapsters it is no doubt the production of some choice spirit who once frequented the boar's head. Bacchus, to give the topping world surprise, produced one sober son, and here he lies. Though reared among full hogshead, he defied the charms of wine, and every one beside. O oh, reader, if to justice thou art inclined, keep honest precedent daily in thy mind. He drew good wine, took care to fill his pots, had sundry virtues that excused his faults, you that on Bacchus have looked like dependents, pray copy Bob in measure and attendance. End footnote. The worthy dignitaries of the church, however, did not appear much captivated by the sober virtues of the tapster. The deputy organist, who had a moist look out of the eye, made one shrewd remark on the abstentionness of a man brought up among full hogsheads, and the little sexton corroborated his opinion by a significant wink and a dubious shake of the head. Thus far my researches, though they threw much light on the history of tapsters, fishmongers, and lord mayors, yet disappointed me in the great object of my quest, the picture of the Boar's Head Tavern. No such painting was to be found in the church of St. Michael's. Mary and amen, said I, here endeth my research. So I was giving the matter up, with the air of a baffled antiquary, when my friend the sexton, perceiving me to be curious in everything relative to the old tavern, offered to show me the choice vessels of the vestry, which had been handed down from remote times when the parish meetings were held at the Boar's Head. These were deposited in the parish club room, 
which had been transferred, on the decline of the ancient establishment, to a tavern in the neighborhood. A few steps brought us to the house, which stands number 12, Miles Lane, bearing the title of the Mason's Arms, and is kept by Master Edward Honeyball, the bully rock of the establishment. It is one of those little taverns which abound in the heart of the city, and form the center of gossip and intelligence of the neighborhood. We entered the bar room, which was narrow and darkling, for in these close lanes but few rays of reflected light are enabled to struggle down to the inhabitants, whose broad day is at best but tolerable twilight. The room was partitioned into boxes, each containing a table spread with a clean white cloth ready for dinner. This showed that the guests were of good old stamp, and divided their day equally, for it was but just one o'clock. At the lower end of the room was a clear coal fire, before which a breast of lamb was roasting. A row of bright brass candlesticks and pewter mugs glistened along the mantelpiece, and an old-fashioned clock ticked in one corner. There was something primitive in this medley of kitchen, parlor, and hall that carried me back to earlier times, and pleased me. The place indeed was humble, but everything had that look of order and neatness which bespeaks the superintendence of a notable English housewife. A group of amphibious-looking beings, who might be either fishermen or sailors, were regaling themselves in one of the boxes. As I was a visitor of rather higher pretensions, I was ushered into a little misshapen back room, having at least nine corners. It was lighted by a skylight, furnished with antiquated leather and chairs, and ornamented with the portrait of a fat pig. It was evidently appropriated to particular customers, and I found a shabby gentleman in a red nose and oilcloth hat, seated in one corner, meditating on a half-empty pot of porter. The old sexton had taken the landlady aside, and with an air of profound importance imparted to her my errand. Dame Honeyball was a lively, plump, bustling little woman, and no bad substitute for that paragon of hostess, Dame Quickly. She seemed delighted with an opportunity to oblige, and hurrying upstairs to the archives of her house, where the precious vessels of the parish club were deposited, she returned, smiling and curtsying, with them in her hands. The first she presented me was a japanned iron tobacco box of gigantic size, out of which, I was told, the vestry had smoked at their stated meeting since time immemorial, and which was never suffered to be profaned by vulgar hands or used on common occasions. I received it with becoming reverence, but what was my delight at beholding on its cover the identical painting of which I was in quest? There was displayed the outside of the Boar's Head Tavern, and before the door was to be seen the whole convivial group at table, in full reveal, pictured with that wonderful fidelity and force with which the portraits of renowned generals and commodores are illustrated on tobacco boxes, for the benefit of posterity. Lest, however, there should be any mistake, the cunning limer had warily inscribed the names of Prince Hal and Falstaff on the bottom of their chairs. On the inside of the cover was an inscription, nearly obliterated, recording that this box was the gift of Sir Richard Gore for the use of the vestry meetings of the Boar's Head Tavern, and that it was repaired and beautified by his successor, Mr. John Packard, 1767. Such is a faithful description of this august and venerable relic, and I question whether the learned Siberius contemplated his Roman shield or the knights of the round table the long-sought sangreal with more exultation. While I was meditating on it with enraptured gaze, Dame Honeyball, who was highly gratified by the interest it excited, put in my hands a drinking cup or goblet which also belonged to the vestry, and was descended from the old boar's head. It bore the inscription of having been the gift of Francis Withers, knight, and was held, she told me, in exceedingly great value, being considered very antique. This last opinion was strengthened by the shabby gentleman with the red nose and old cloth hat, and whom I strongly suspected of being a lineal descendant from the variable Baroff. He suddenly aroused from his meditation of the pot of porter, and casting a lowing look on the goblet, exclaimed, Ay, ay, the head don't ache now that that made there that article. The great importance attached to this memento of ancient revelry by modern church wardens at first puzzled me, but there is nothing sharpens the apprehension so much as antiquarian research, for I immediately perceived that this could be no other than the identical parcel gift goblet on which Falstaff made his loving but faithless vow to Dame Quickly, and which would, of course, be treasured up with care among the regalia of her domains as a testimony of that solemn contract. Footnote. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet, sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea coal fire on Wednesday, in Whitson Week, when the prince broke thy head for likening his father to a singing man at Windsor. Thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing my wound, to marry me, and make me my lady, thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Henry the Fourth, Part Two. End footnote. Mine hostess, indeed, gave me a long history how the goblet had been handed down from generation to generation, 
She also entertained me with many particulars concerning the worthy vestrymen who had seated themselves thus quietly on the stools of the ancient roisterers of Eastcheap, and, like so many commentators, utter clouds of smoke in honor of Shakespeare. These I forbade to relate, lest my readers should not be as curious in these matters as myself. Suffice it to say, the neighbors, one and all, about Eastcheap, believe that Falstaff and his merry crew actually lived and reveled there. Nay, there are several legendary anecdotes concerning him still extant among the older frequenters of Mason's Arms, which they give as transmitted down from their forefathers, and of Mr. McCash, an Irish hairdresser, whose shop stands on the site of the old boar's head, has several dry jokes of fat jacks, not laid down in the books, with which he makes his customers ready to die of laughter. I now turned to my friend the sexton to make some further inquiries, but I found him sunk in pensive meditation. His head had declined a little on one side, a deep sigh, he from the very bottom of his stomach, and though I could not see a tear trembling in his eye, yet a moisture was evidently stealing from a corner of his mouth. I followed the direction of his eye through the door which stood open, and found it fixed wistfully on the savory breast of lamb, roasting in dripping richness before the fire. I now called to mind that in the eagerness of my recondite investigation I was keeping the poor man from his dinner. My bowels yearned with sympathy, and putting in his hand a small token of my gratitude and goodness, I departed with a hearty benediction on him, Dame Honeyball, and the Parish Club of Crooked Lane, not forgetting my shabby but sententious friend in the oilcloth hat and copper nose. Thus have I given a tedious brief account of this interesting research, for which, if it proved too short and unsatisfactory, I can only plead my inexperience in this branch of literature, so deservedly popular at the present day. I am aware that a more skillful illustrator of the immortal bard would have swelled the materials I have touched upon to a good merchantable bulk, comprising the biographies of William Walsworth, Jack Straw, and Robert Preston, some notice of the eminent fishmongers of St. Michael's, the history of East Cheap, great and little, private anecdotes of Dame Honeyball and her pretty daughter, whom I have not even mentioned, to say nothing of a damsel tending the breast of lamb, and whom, by the way, are remarks to be a comely lass with a neat foot and ankle, the whole enlivened by the riots of Watt Tyler, and illuminated by the great fire of London. All this I leave as a rich mine, to be worked by future commentators, nor do I despair of seeing the tobacco box and the parcel gilt goblet, which I have thus brought to light the subject of future engravings, and almost as fruitful of voluminous dissertations and disputes as the shield of Achilles or the far-flamed Portland vase. <laughs>